you know, we started out before the Beijing Olympics to turn the British team who were doing what they were told. You know, a lot of the coaches had come out of the armed forces and it was like, if this, then that, you know. Seven, respond with a 14, you know, is that okay, you know. So our guys are beyond the line, ready, ready to start, you know. You know I know what I'm gonna do. Our commentators, you know, on the BBC Sport would say, oh, here comes Brendan Foster and he's gonna run two fast laps and then steady in the swim. Everybody knew what was gonna happen. The trouble was, be some plucky king, you know, go sort of leg it off and we go, I've never seen Ozzy, I've never, never seen him before. And um, people didn't know how to react because they do it by numbers, didn't include a number for that scenario. So a lot of the work, sport by sport and eventually I think with all the sports, is about how, how do you prepare for the unexpected? Well, in learning, one way you prepare for the unexpected is by making the learning unexpected. You know, so I come in and, uh, oh, um, we can have a discovery day. You know, the, the lonely kids in the space with me, we're, we're building a model of the town where we live in. We're doing geometry and maths and construction and uh, maybe some, I don't know, some, some fashion and design. We're having a whole day with the parents are all coming at three to see how much we've done. Look, so most of you better get started, you know, or it's, it's the aggregation of marginal gains, which is the language of a Brailsford in cycling and Sparky and sailing and all. You know, all the guys leading these these things are all saying the same thing, you know. The little moments like when the rowers shared rooms with the sailors and the rowers suddenly realised how much time the sailors were putting in to making their hulls perfectly fair. So we, we don't do that, we just the boat arrives, we give them a polish, put them in the water, we go rowing. So they did the fittings and they said, well, you know, on a course, that's worth five to nine inches at the finish. And I think since then there have been three medals decided by less than nine inches. For a kid in, a, in an exam room, you know, where 1% is going to determine, you know, the D to the C, going to determine the set you're going to be in if the school's still streaming, let's hope not, you know. It's going to determine the university you go to, you're going to determine whether you get an interview for that job or not, 1%. Yeah, we know that just by putting the light levels up and the temperature down, kids can pick up three or four percent. You know, partly because of the obsession with KPIs and quantification, we've lost art and performance and imagination and play. It's quite hard to build a KPI for play, you know. That's smile on me, you know. <laughs> um, so because of that, those things aren't valued enough, but we know that those are a key part of ingenuity. You know, graphene was invented because of Play Fridays. You know, that the two guys at Manchester University invented graphene Friday afternoon. They said, right, stop, let's do something silly. Their previous something silly was to say, there's a lot of uh, iron in blood plasma. So I reckon if we had a strong enough magnetic, magnetic field, we could levitate a frog. So they built this massive um, magnetic field. They got the frog kind of airborne. I mean, history doesn't say whether the frog was impressed or not, but you know, yeah, 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 that was good. And then later on, one of them had a piece of sellotape and peeled it off a piece of paper and noticed that the graphite for the pencil on the paper was also on the sellotape. And just asked a simple question, I wonder how many times I could do that and keep getting lead on the sellotape. And it turned out to be a very large number because they were peeling off a single atomic layer of graphite. <laughs> And they said, hmm, that's handy, you know. The other superconductivity strength, you know, there's a million things where you know, the atomic particle layer of, of, of graphite is pretty special. And so the invention came out of Plato. And so, you know, cutting back to learning and work and all those things, we know people like Google that build space for play. But kind of my view is that's wrong. You know, the act of learning should be playful. You shouldn't say, Stop learning now, do something playful. If we're lucky, something good will come of it. And uh, the learning itself should be playful. And you make it playful, you know, with challenge, with ingenuity, with the, the joy of discovery, you know. That, you know, uh, we surveyed a thousand people twice. So what was your best learning experience? And it was like a, it was like a, 
and unashamedly constructed this model of learning. You know, they said we were doing something with others. What we were doing was hard. We had an audience for, our, for when we finished doing it. We had there was a teacher or coach or parent mentoring, helping us, helping us along. You know, all those things were good. Um, but they remember that their teachers were a little bit mad. mad. You know, they said, oh, they were eccentric. You know, they were crazy about geography, sort of mad about terminal moraines or dotty about my big pentameter or whatever, you know. And they remember the eccentricity of those teachers, which is what made the learning playful. You know? So if you, if you invent an education system where teachers all have to have you take the same qualifications and I've even been in, I've been in schools where they have dress codes for the teachers. And it's like, can you imagine anything less likely to make learning happen? You know, you remember your slightly dotty art teacher in her, you know, a caftan and, you know, and that chemist who, he always wore that corduroy jacket. But you could see the chemistry on the sleeves, you know. Yes. Uh, and that scorch mark on the arm where he went to near the Bunsen burner, but he kept wearing the jacket. Those are the things you remember. And cognitively, those, that's the social punctuation. You know, 93% of your brain is busy pattern matching, 7% of the, you know, your brain is, is remembering, and the pattern matching is built on those social cues and clues. So, of course you want your teachers to be a bit crazy. Of course you want your room to be different to the room next door, and different to how it was last week. Because that's how cognitive science tells us we learn.